I have it on trail. Hey, everybody, you're here listening to the Dirt Trail Running Podcast, Coffee with Coaches with Coach Loretta and Coach Reese. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I think we have a pretty fun episode. Uh, this past weekend was the Galena Sky, Sky Trail Run, and we're going to kind of do a little dive into that, talk about the race and talk about some great strategies for racing. And you're here with the winner, overall winner of the four hour and new course record holder, Coach, Coach Reese. What was your uh, distance again? Was My distance, so um, it was like, it was just over 32, 32.01. Nice. Like that. So that was in four hours, correct? Yep. Yes. Nice. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was a fun day. It was a fun course and it was absolutely beautiful. And, you know, um, for anybody listening to this one that, you know, may want some more Galena information, um, there is going to be another podcast releasing on our platform here, um, talking more about the course and about other race experiences. Um, you know, it's me, my girlfriend, Sid, Nikki, and then uh, Kyle, who got second place. So, and Michelle, of course. So, if anybody is looking for more just right away, you know, you can um, go to our YouTube channel and it's going to be coming out on Spotify sometime soon. Um, so, I have a feeling this one's going to release beforehand. But yeah, keep an eye out for it because um, we kind of go into some of our stories in that podcast. Okay, that sounds exciting too. So um, why don't you just start us off and tell us a little bit about Galena. I've heard that it's just absolutely the town itself is beautiful, but I've also heard that on the course, you can see bald eagles. Did you see any bald eagles? I think so. You know, somebody told us that we were looking at turkey vultures. And to tell you the <laughs> truth, I wasn't really looking up as much as I was like looking down and looking at the Mississippi. Yeah. So yeah, I guess just like, you know, an overall perspective, like, you know, I live just outside of Chicago now in Barrington. So from here, it's about two and a half hours away, basically straight west. It's a beautiful drive. You have rolling farm country that's not too bland. Um, and then by the time you get about like an hour away from um, the resort, Chestnut Mountain, where it's at, um, you hit these really cool vistas, just really big hills, and it's very undulating terrain. Uh, vistas where you can actually kind of see across um, multiple hilltops and, and fields and farms and cool towns and stuff like that. So um, compared to our last drive um, to southern Illinois, when we went to Garden of the Gods State Park, the drive was just it was easy. It was amazing. Um, the roads were great. So if anybody's looking for like a quick commute to an awesome race and lives somewhere in the area or in Wisconsin, Iowa, whatever it is, um, it's going to be a cool, cool drive. Nice. But so you nice end up weekend getaway too. Like there's things to do in the town after the race, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And the race is literally right outside of this resort. So um, my girlfriend, Deanna Ninehouse and I um, got a room and on this resort, you either face towards the Mississippi River or away from the Mississippi River. And we got a good view towards the Mississippi River. So um, when we were upstairs changing before our four hours started, you know, all the eight hour runners were still running. So you could see people going by and we opened up our That's window so and we're cheering people on. Um, so yeah, I mean, as far as access and lodging, like you're not going to have to find some place to boondock your van. You're not going to have to, you know, find some place that's in the next town over and then get up super early to drive. If you book a room at the resort, you get a discount. You can just wake up five minutes before the start, walk outside and you're good to go. So, I mean, um, as far as conveniency and logistics, this race is dynamite. Nice. That's exciting. So there's a four hour and there's an eight hour, correct? Mm -hmm. yep. So, uh, yeah. So tell us a little bit about the course. What's it, what's it like? So the eight hour runners start at eight o'clock in the morning and they run till four and the four hour runners start at noon and they end at four. So everybody ends at the same time, which is really cool. Um, but when you start the course, when you start the run, you're going to hit primarily a flat section. The way that they had it set up this year was, you know, you, you start, you run a little flat, you kind of hit this little bump and then you hit the main aid station area. And it's kind of like, um, like a kind of crushed limestone path that the aid station is on right next to the hotel. So um, the overall course isn't too technical. Um, they've been doing a lot of maintenance um, and a lot of building for mountain bike trails um, and, and whatnot. So it's not like if anybody's familiar with the Ice Age Trail, it's not super like river rocky or pebbly or bouldery. Um, so as far as technicality, it's great. You end up hitting this um, primarily flat section. You kind of go down a little a little um bump that's kind of right along the mississippi river um or i guess like just just above so you're actually kind of like looking down at the ski slopes as you're going through um but then you hit this pretty much like a fire road kind of that's a nice false flat it goes downhill and after about a half a mile on that or so you kind of uh bank a right hand turn and you get this really cool vista overlooking the mississippi river and i think that there's um there's there's a lot of weddings that happen there so it's a cool view for sure um 
And then you end up going into the forest, you hit a couple moguls, a couple rollers, and then you hit a couple uphills and you're kind of turning around and coming back towards the start. So it's really, um, the whole course is two lollipops kind of, um, I guess two loops, I should say, because um, they don't like cross the same. It's not like a lollipop out and back. So you got two loops. Um, you're going to hit the north loop first. As you're coming back, you're going to run right past the aid station again. So I don't think you're ever really further than a mile and a half away from aid if you need it. Um, so by the time you come back, you're coming back on fire roads again. Um, you're passing the aid station on your right. You're passing, you know, the timer. And this year it was Sid who was giving everybody some woohoos. So you got some good motivation as he cheers you on passing through. Um, and then you go to the south section, which is a little bit more hilly um, and a little bit longer. So it's kind of deceiving by the time you pass the aid station the first time, you're not quite halfway through with the course. Um, but from there, you're in the woods again, you're out of exposure um, and you're going up and down some rollers. You got some good climbs. You end up getting another good vista, the Mississippi River again. Um, you kind of crest and turn around the ski lift. And then all of a sudden you're coming down the chute to go back into the start finish line. So overall, it's about like just under three miles or so um, okay. per big loop. Um, the way that they have it set is, you know, if you are running the four, the eight hour, if you don't think that you have enough time to complete one more loop, but you're left with 30, 40, 50 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, they do have a smaller um, out and back that you can do to just keep banking up more miles. So okay. um, you can complete, complete as many big loops as you want and then go out and back in the small loops. So overall, if I were to summarize everything, I would say that the course is non-technical. It's very well supported because you're never too far away from aid. It's very scenic and you're going to hit some areas of exposure and you're going to hit some areas of shade. So depending on if the course like this past year was moderately warm or hot, um, or if like last year, um, you know, 2022, I think it was like 85 degrees for a high and the heat was killing people. You can really get variable um, weather on that course as well. But overall, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be a great race. If you wanted to try new aid station tactics, if you wanted to try new fueling or nutrition, because you're never going to be too far away from support or from your own gear. Um, for example, this year I have never drank just straight honey in a race. Um, so I was hydrating with some gnarly. And then I was taking shots of honey from a little bear I had in my hand um, whenever I felt like I needed to gel. It was great. I actually loved it. It was pretty good. Um, but say if that didn't work out, you know, I was never too far away from just ditching that and grabbing some aid station food or grabbing some of my other gels that I brought, you know, so um, you can really get experimental in these in these types of races without, you know, being in the back country and stranded away from your gear. Yeah. So let's one second, talk about this honey. What made you decide to <laughs> drink the honey bear? <laughs> so, you know, I kind of, I, I detailed this um, last night on um, when we recorded the other podcast. Oh, okay. That's be okay. Um, so, but I guess just to reiterate a little bit, like my, my brain in terms of like ultra, um, ultra performance um, and preparedness thinks in terms of parameters. I don't really think in terms of I need this product or I need this much product. Um, you know, I'm not tied to this brand over that brand over another brand. The way that my brain thinks is I know that I want to get at least 200 calories an hour, preferably 250 to 300 calories an hour, whether that comes from drink mix or it comes from goose or chews or peanut butter sandwiches, um, whatever it is, that's, that's my goal. So really in that parameter of, 250 to 300 calories an hour. Um, I experiment with everything. I experiment with, you know, real foods, honey, um, nut bars, granola bars, whatever it is. Um, so I feel like during training, I've built up my stomach to be able to tolerate, to, to be able to tolerate um, straight granola bars, you know, in, in training at, at race paces. Um, so I thought to myself, you know what, instead of spending like 30 or $40 worth of gels for a four hour effort, I'm just going to go to Aldi buy a $4 like t little, little bear and just hold on to it. I mean, it didn't have a strap on it, so it wasn't, you know, super convenient to hold, but it was lighter than my water bottle on the other hand. So you carried so, the little bear with you? Yeah. So I carried the little oh, bear with great. me. The time. <laughs> <laughs> Got a little messy, you know, but, um, as I flipped the top and, and tried to try to chug right. it, but, um, I went into the effort, not thinking like I, I wanted to you know, get another course record. I just wanted to go in and have like a strong supported long run before kettle and um, everything else that happened was just kind of a bonus. So um, that was nice. It worked out well. And for any of the listeners out there, I, I would encourage you, you know, not to pigeonhole yourself into one specific fueling strategy because not all fuel works for all individuals all the time. 
Right. So, and I um, mean, yeah. just something to say from a coach's view is, you know, normally we're saying don't try new things on race day, but mm-hmm. Reese was using this more as a training run race day. So it was a good um, practice and test before his big A race, which is coming up for kettle. So I think, you know, just like kind of clarifying that normally we don't just try like anything on race day, right? Yeah, I guess, you know, for like our nomenclature that we like to, we like to um, designate, like this was more of like a C race, I guess, yes, like yeah, um, yeah. me and my girlfriend were really planning on running it until about two weeks beforehand. So I guess you could call it like a, like a pop-up effort, um, went and volunteered the night beforehand, didn't put too much pressure on it, just went out, had a good time, made sure I cheered everybody on as I was going through because, you know, like it was just a fun event, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's why I decided to, you know, play around with my, with my gear. So for anybody listening, that would be absolutely a fantastic course. If you're trying to test out your kettle nutrition, if you're trying to test out like something new, a new piece of gear, um, and you don't, you're not taking that as your primary focus for a race. That is a fantastic playground to, to alter things on the fly. Nice. So will, um, the little bear be going to kettle? Hmm. Uh, (laughs) I don't know. Actually, to tell you the truth, I might get some of those like tiny little honey packets, um, Uh because the bear was just too messy. I want to do, you know what I did last year with the two handhelds and whatnot. So I might need more convenient foods. Um, but you know, I mean, for training runs, for long runs, for trying to keep costs down, you know, like, um, like ultra running is awesome because all you need is a pair of shoes to go out and do it. But of course, like, you know, everybody has all the other gadgets and the food and the nutrition and everything supporting the run itself. So any way that I can like, you know, make healthy decisions and, um, you know, be, be cost effective, um, and have things taste great. Like that's awesome. So if anybody wants to try that, like you have, yeah, packets might be good, but I kind of, I kind of want a picture of you carrying the little honey bear running. So there might, there might be, because, you know, Jenny LT was out there taking photos. I I had it all day. (laughs) Um, yeah, I was oddly proud of it um so, <laughs> i can yeah. see this that's why i got to see the picture <laughs> for anybody out the there, listeners you know. watch for pictures to be posted uh, about um galena sky maybe we'll get to see coach reese with his bear yeah there's <laughs> a multitude of ways to fuel yourself out there so um, <laughs> get experimental get crazy and have fun for sure right right so you know we're talking about looped courses and it is it's a great opportunity to practice nutrition because it keeps you it can keep you very consistent especially if you're coming around, you know, hitting that aid station all the time and you kind of figure out, okay, at what point do I need to rehydrate or refuel? You're always there and it, you know, everything's same and you can actually put all of your stuff there too. It's always in the same spot and it it does make it easier for us to, I think, train that consistency piece. Looped courses are fantastic for strategy all around nutrition or even race strategy, right? Like a lot of times um, I talk with my athletes about, Hey, are we going to be pushing the uphills? Are we going to be going easy on the uphills so we can push on the downhills? Are we going to take everything easy so you can rip the flats? Um, It really depends on the athlete's strength and weakness. Um, So, you know, going there, I'd never been to the course and usually like with earth day, um, you know, like I previewed the course a bunch. Um, So, if you're going to do a looped course like that and you're doing a four hour event, you're going to go through at least a handful of times. So by the time I think I had like 11 total loops or something like that, um, you know, like you get really familiar really easily. And while I was running the race, I was thinking to myself, okay, where's going to be the easiest place um, to fuel? Where's going to be the easiest place to push? What hills are deceptively tough? Um, as well as where are the parts of exposure? Where do I need to douse myself off with water when I get hot? Um, the most exposed part is definitely by the, um, by the start finish line. So every time I was going, you know, I think I, I skipped the aid station probably three or four or five times maybe. Um, and then by the time I had to refill up on water, it's like I was taking cups of water and just dousing myself because it was super warm and you only have another mile of um, getting beat down by the sun. Um, so then by the time I would come back through on the later laps, I would already be completely dry, even though I was in the shade. Um, so I think at one point I had Willie, um, Willie Mangrum, I think is how you say his last name. I was running through. I was like, Willie, just pour it on me. Just pour it on me, you know? Um, so he chased me down and just like dumped the jug on me. It was my very last lap and I was getting pretty warm. Um, so yeah, you can, you can strategize how you're taking the hills, when and where you need to cool off. Um, and you can do that mid race too. So anybody that can't get out there to like preview it, like, don't worry, you're going to be well familiar with the course by the time you're done. Okay. What kind of shoes would you wear on that course? Um, I would, I mean, so 
if you're taking it as a practice run for another race, I would definitely wear like your A race kit just to make sure like, Hey, yeah. how is everything, um, wearing, especially, you know, if we go out, like most of our long runs in training are probably going to be what, like they might top out like four to six hours. And that might be like pushing it. You know, there's not a lot of athletes. Um, I would tell like, Hey, go run a six hour, like effort a couple weeks before your, your a race. Right. Like instead I like to stack some, some workouts, um, in a couple days just to get people recovery. Um, but if you're going to go to that race, sometimes things don't start to wear on your body, like give you chafe marks until eight, nine, 10 hours. Right. So if you go for the eight hour race, um, you know, that's going to be able to tell you like, Hey, where are my shoes rubbing at six hours in at seven hours in things might be comfortable for three or four hours. It doesn't mean they're going to be comfortable all, all day. Right. So, um, if you're going to take it as a training run for your next race, definitely wear your race kit if you can, um, for everybody else that's taking it as like their focus and want to have a good day, make sure that you've tried it in training beforehand. But as far as being particular on needing trail or road shoes, if it's a dry year, you could definitely get by in road shoes. If that's, if those are more comfortable for you, there's no parts that are too like, like, um, I guess like, uh, river rocky or slippery or sandy um you get a lot of crushed limestone crushed gravel um you get some hard packed dirt um so yeah i mean for anybody that's wondering you know maybe when you go up there next year and it's your a race bring like your favorite road shoes and your favorite trail shoes um but for most of us trail runners it's going to be your trail shoes for sure right right you know? So, you know, I, you know, I have a lot of experience with looped courses, but so I just kind of want to want your viewpoint because some people will be like looped courses. That's so boring doing the same thing over and over. I don't want to do that. What's your take on that? What's my take on that? Yeah. Um, Did you feel I that think, way? Did you feel bored? <laughs> you know, if you're going there for scenery, I think it's a great course because you get those vistas. You're going to see them a bunch all day. So if you're doing the eight hour, you're probably going to get desensitized to them after like four or five, six hours, whatever it might be. Um, but as far as like the community, the community is never gonna, you know, like, uh, bore you, I guess. Like, and that's why like during these runs, like I like to hoot and holler at people and point people out. And, um, you know, so I, I guess the race is as fun as other people make it, you know? Yeah. Yep. Um, for example, there was a gal, I don't know if she listens or not, but there was a gal who was wearing, um, ice cream tights, <laughs> and the ice cream itself had like a little skull face on it. So every time I ran by her, I was like, death by ice cream, you know, <laughs> just being goofy out there. So just hopefully to cheer other people up if they're, um, you know, like uh, not having a good time or whatnot. So yeah. um, I would say if you're doing a looped course and things are a little bit boring for you, then maybe you can, you know, take initiative to, to make things more fun for you. I think it's a great right. way to practice those mental skills of like, hey, you know, like, if I don't have music, if, you know, like the scenery isn't that cool, like where does my mind go? How do I practice those mental tools? So Absolutely. I'm definitely not a fan of saying like, Hey, do hard things because hard things make you better, you know, but sometimes getting ourselves out of these comfort zones is cool. But I mean, like you're not going to be bored. Like the volunteers are awesome. The people are awesome. The course is varied enough that like, you're going to be able to find something that you can connect yeah. with. Um, I've so, definitely but, never been, yeah, I've never been bored during a looped course and yeah. something like that. And the way you describe it, I've never been to Galena, but, uh, when it's so varied like that, sometimes I don't even realize it's the same loop, you know what I mean? Because it's new, it almost like you see something new each loop. So it doesn't feel like, oh, I'm so tired of running the same loop. And like mm -hmm. you said, just you're around so many more people than you are like on an out, you know, a point to point because you know, you're doing the same loop. So you're either passing people or being passed by people. So it's exciting all day because you're seeing people and having fun. So, yeah. And, you know, like I, um, you know, I consume a lot of cycling podcasts and mountain biking podcasts because aerobic endurance is, as far as the principles of your body creating energy is similar across like all modalities. Right. So, um, one thing that I think mountain bikers have, um, in mind that us trail runners don't is picking our lines on trail. And what that means is like um, that. when you're on a bike, you have to be really particular about what features and what part of the trail you hit, because if you're not hitting tangents or if you're going through like rough patches of, of pitted ground, it's really going to rattle you and shake you. And I think looped courses, especially this one, offer a great opportunity for you to play around with, 
hey, do I hit the tangents? What does it feel like when I take this line instead of this line? Does it feel more smooth? Does it feel faster? Um, and you know, since it's not too technical, you can easily avoid the technical, the you know, the technical like pitted out spots that there are. Um, you know, or you can see what it's like to go through them, you know? So I think if you're taking this looped course during the race, you have all of these opportunities to try out different lines. Do I hug the inside line? Do I stay on the outside and then swoop in? Like what type of terrain do I feel the most comfortable on? Um, so that's, that's why I bring that up. If anybody, you know, um, you know, mountain bikes out there, you know exactly what I'm talking about because the line that you take on your trail can make all the difference. Of course, right. they're going a lot faster than we are, but when we're talking about these long races of 15, 20, 30 hours plus, whatever it might be, um, the tangents that you do or don't hit can absolutely make or break the distance, um, you know, rolling an ankle or just being comfortable and flowing a trail easily, especially around right, switchbacks. Right. And I think that's really important you mentioned it. I mean, as a you know, former cross country coach, that's something we talked about too. You can cut off distance off these courses if you run them smarter, not the longer you know, route around the curves. And so it is, it does give you something for your mind to think about like, okay, what is the shortest point from A to B to get, you know, around the course and how much can I cut off? You know, it can become a little bit of a mental challenging, fun game to play along the way, because I have watched people like in cross country running like the line, it didn't help. I mean, like they were running the longest part because they were following the line rather than following the shortest point. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, that, that was huge. And you know, the trails are wide enough too that like, um, you can get really experimental without getting in other people's way. It's not like you're on a bunch of single tracks. So for the speed demons out there that just want to rip around and not like have to worry about constantly yelling on your left on your left on your left, you know, or for the people that, um, you know, maybe chasing, you know, like their, their own time or usually chase cutoffs and are a little bit self-conscious about being slower. Um, don't worry because you're always going to have your space on the trail and there's going to be plenty of space for people to go around you. Um, so I know that can be kind of intimidating for some people. Um, so this is really a great, um, event for all people to be around all people all the time. You're going to be with this, you know, the speedsters are going to be with you cheering you on, um, you know, and everybody finishes together, which is, which is huge. It's great. So. Nice. And I think so, the eight hour runners get a little bit of motivation too, from the four hour <laughs> runners starting and then just, you know. Yeah, I think that that's really cool because, you know, by four hours in, you're starting to get tired and that gives you some new excitement to have next group joining. So I think that that's really cool, too. So as this race, if somebody were wanting to choose it, let's say for their A race as a coach, what are some things that you would think about to advise your athlete or maybe some training things that you would incorporate to be ready for this race as an A race? Yep. Since there's hardly any flat, I think in the weeks leading up to the race, I would focus more on um, hill transitions. So since this race, you're, you're never going up for too long. You're never going down for too long. Um, and you're really never going flat for too long. Um, you have to be pretty efficient at alternating between your, your uphill mechanics, your uphill legs, your flat legs, your downhill legs. So, um, I think that, you know, like, um, I would say, you know, immediately the couple weeks before the race, maybe like three to six weeks out or so, I would do some hillier tempos and just have people experiment with, hey, like, what does this effort feel like holding a consistent effort when you're going uphill versus when you're going flat or downhill? Because of course, we're going to be moving slower when we're going uphill, we're going to be moving faster when we go downhill and just practice being smooth on varied terrain. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's huge. Um, and that's something that we don't talk about is that, you know, we have our uphill intervals, we have our downhill intervals, but what about that little gap in between? Like I would highly recommend like anybody in the area, go to veteran acres and pick one of those single track trails that's in the Stearns Woods side and practice what it's like having to navigate going uphill and then immediately coming back downhill and try to be smooth and try to keep your effort controlled. I think it's pretty tough for um, a lot of people to modify their effort because when we're going uphill, we're going slower. It gets in our head. We're like, oh crap, we're going slower. I got to go faster, but now I'm going faster. I'm going harder and now I'm burning myself out, you know? So I think that would be huge. Um, before, before that, say like maybe six to 10 weeks out, um, I would want my athletes doing some uphill stride work, um, something that's not too, not too demanding. Like we're not going to be doing super hard hill intervals. I don't think that you need to do anything more than like, you know, 30 to 90 seconds or so going, going uphill a little bit harder to get your legs a little bit more prepared for the power that they'll have to put out on race day. Um, so those would be some pretty good hill workouts that you can do. Um, 
and then, um, you know, before that, maybe like, you know, 10 to 14 weeks out or so, you know, definitely doing, you know, just building up the mileage, getting the wheels comfortable, getting the legs comfortable with, um, with just turning over and turning over all day. Maybe your strategy for your long runs and that entire buildup would be time-based instead of distance-based, right? Because we don't know exactly on race day how many miles we're going to get, but we know that we're going to have to be outside taking care of ourselves for a particular amount of time. So maybe you use that instead of saying like, oh, I'm going to build from 10 to 12 to 14 to 16 mile long runs or whatever it might be. Maybe you take that and say, okay, I'm going to build, you know, hour and a half and then two hour and then two and a half and then three hour long runs and then just kind of guide your way, guide your way up. Right. And I think that's smart anyway, especially when we're trending a lot on trails to go by time versus distance, just because you know, depending on which trail you pick that day, the difficulty could change. And so it may take you longer to run if you were going by a distance versus a time. So I think that kind of keeps it a little bit safe that we're not jumping up, you know, a lot in time by, because the trail you picked was harder that day. Yep, absolutely. So I think the most important thing for this race is just going to be being comfortable switching between your different gears, you know, like, Um, some people can grind uphill for a really long time and they got a really awesome power hike and that's cool. But these hills are no more than like 50 feet in height, you know, like if that, but they're going to hit you all the time. Um, and then it's going to be proceed or it's going to be, um, it's going to be followed by a downhill, you know? So you got some moguls and stuff like that in there. So yeah, smoothness in the transitions between uphill and downhill is going to be. What about for the athlete that plans on typically in a race, um, walking or power hiking hills, is this a good course that you could, could do that? Or would you need to think of a different strategy? I mean, a lot of times, you know, we go into a race thinking I'm going to power hike all the hills. Would that work with this course? Or would we, um, maybe determine based on the size of the, the hill at that point? Absolutely. It definitely depends on the athlete, right? Like some of us only power hike hills. Some of us um, can determine, Hey, is this, is this a running hill or is this a power hiking hill? Mm -hmm. So that comes down to training that comes down to um, feeling out about what percentage of a hill is going to be something that you power hike. Right. And that's um, that kind of comes down to when we were talking about, you know, going out and doing a hilly run where you try to be smooth the entire time. You never want to feel super choppy. Like, uh Oh, I'm hitting this hill. And now I have to start hiking immediately um, and have my pace drop. Right. Like we want to like take the downhill coast into the downhill and then transition. And maybe we're kind of transitioning into a hike um, after jogging for a little bit, starting up the hill and then letting the steepness of the hill and our effort guide us into, is this a hiking hill or is this a running hill? Um, so of course, if somebody is going to be hiking, um, a majority of the Hills, I would say most of the Hills are between like, you know, eight to some of them might be about like 12%, 13%. Um, you know, you can easily go onto a treadmill and just see like, what does this grade feel like? Am I going to want to hike this or is it more efficient for me to run it? Um, there's been workouts I've had where I go on a Hill and I just crank it up to 15 and I start at like, you know, one mile per hour. And I just slowly start to narrow it up and I try to power hike for as long as I can. And then just kind of see like where that speed is or what that effort feels like when all of a sudden my legs are kind of hiking as fast as they can go. And now it's more efficient for me to take like smaller cadence, like jogging steps. Right. So that would be a great way to start to play around with, Hey, what percentage of hill am I going to start to power hike at? Right. And I think, you know, I think that's really good. I have a lot of athletes that live in areas that are really flat. So they don't have a lot of hills to practice on. So sometimes the treadmill is a great solution to be able to mimic some of that. But I also have some athletes that don't have hills or treadmills. Do you have any suggestions or ideas for training on the course for like that? I mean, that's a tough one, but I have people that are there in that situation. I think there is an awesome saying. I think it was Frank Shorter who said like hills are speed work in disguise. I might be misattributing that, but everybody has heard that before. I firmly believe that it goes the other way too. I think speed work are hills in disguise. Um, and there's a lot of, I, you know, David Roach on trail runner mag has um, a bunch of good articles detailing, you know, the transitions from speed to hill work and just how speed really influences your ability and your aerobic capacity to go up and down hills. Um, so if you are in a very flat area, um, of course, we're not going to be able to specifically work on those downhills or those uphill mechanics, but at least by doing some sort of speed work, well, whether it's strides or some tempo runs or some harder intervals, um, we can at least get the legs conditioned to putting in a good effort. Right. Um, I think we've all had that feeling where 
um, you know, after the first time of doing speed work in a long time, like you kind of get some like quad soreness and stuff like that from the speed work. Um, much like you would get some quad soreness going downhill and in, in a, in a downhill race, you know? So, um, while there's not like an extreme amount of crossover, you know, um, you can definitely prepare your legs that way. Otherwise, if you can find stairwells, if you can find, um, you know, like, let's say like Galena is a town, right. That the Galena race is in, in, when you're in the downtown area, you look around and it almost looks like San Francisco, the way that some of these hills just go, or these, these roads go straight up the hills, you know? So, and they all have stairs that are right next to them. So, you know, yeah. doing, doing a handful of repeats that way, going to a stadium and doing some bleacher runs, something like that would be, um, would be amazing. Um, and you don't have to do it all the time, right? Like, right. um, there's been a lot of good success with athletes. Um, and David Roach mentions this too in his articles, lots of good success with people who, you know, can't access the mountains really frequently. So maybe Monday through Friday, they do their easy runs. They do some of their speedier workouts. And then by the weekend time, that's really the only time they can get a majority of their, um, their hill work in. So we don't have to be super rigid about always getting hills in our training if our race is going to be hilly. Um, and I think that's a great way to avoid um, any overuse injuries or staleness um, from particular types of terrain. So um, if somebody doesn't have access to hills, I say don't worry about it. There's a plethora of other options to do. Strength training can even help prepare your legs for um, the impacts of downhill running as well. Yep, I totally agree. Thanks for sharing those tips, though, because I think some people get a little concerned about that. And and you're right. I think also we have to be careful. We wouldn't want to, probably wouldn't want to, if we didn't have to do hills every day, because again, that becomes more of a harder effort. It's harder to do an easy recovery run if you're running lots of, you know, hills and climbing a lot. Yep. Or to keep your heart rate down, you know, in those situations. So. Yep, absolutely. And sometimes, you know, for me out in Barrington here, like, it's relatively flat. Like if I go onto my trails, like in a 20 mile long run, I might get like a thousand feet of elevation gain. Um, which, you know, if you drive 30 minutes out to veteran acres, you do a 20 mile long run, you'll probably get around 3000, you know? Yeah. So, um, for me, Monday through Friday, when I'm working at the clinic, you know, like I'm just running out the doorstep and instead of doing like 50 hill repeats on something that's, you know, a 10th of a mile long, it's like, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to use that as my speedier days. And then the days when I can get on to some more serious elevation, then that's when I practice my uphill legs and yeah. I practice my downhill legs. Yeah. I think that's great. So is there anything else that you want to share about Galena? Any last uh, tips or secrets to success? <laughs> you know, I think, I think that wraps it up for the most part. And if anybody like, you know, has any other particular questions about them, you know, like on the podcast, we try to keep it pretty, um, pretty broad. Um, recommendations, right? Because everybody is their own individual athlete. Um, if anybody has any questions, like feel free to hit us up or if you're looking to train for next year, it's never too early to start. I just started working with a few athletes that are already preparing for 2024 because they know, hey, they got big goals and they're going to need a while to, to build up smartly. So if anybody has any particular questions about themselves, their training, contact us um, at Trail Run Coaching and we'd be more than happy to help for sure. Yeah. And I have one question, you know, we like to answer um listener questions and i do have one but let me just look it up because it's a little bit buried it's one i sent to you and here it is um putting coach reese on the spot how long after running a hilly 50k that you ran and feel good from should you wait before running training on hills again i don't think we've ever had a question where the answer isn't it depends um <laughs> right so i'm gonna give the listeners something to chew over for sure um because the factors that are going to alter how long it's going to be for you to go into like more training or do another race or something like that is going to be your fitness level going in as well as your recovery coming out, right? If you have been building up and you're consistently putting in 20 plus mile long runs, um, you know, and then you do a 50 K it's probably not going to take you out as much as if you built up to only one long run of 16 miles because you've been battling injury and you were sick the past week. Um, so, you know, it's, there's no definitive, like, I really don't like the generic recommendation people have for marathon training, which is, you know, like, Oh, wait, you know, like at least one day per like five miles of race running or whatever it is before you even think about running again. Um, you know, for me personally, I, you know, I use Galena as um, kind of a C race and I was very trained going in. I definitely took the next day off just because I feel good right now. I want to keep feeling good. So 
I thought to myself, a planned rest day is a lot better than one where I get injured and then have to take rest. Um, but then by Monday I was up and I was doing some easier runs, you know, um, you got to honor your body and be really conscious of, Hey, do I feel any aches or niggles or pains as well as listen to your mind? I think your mind is going to be the biggest, um, the biggest thing that you have when you're looking for, when can I get back to racing and training again? Because if you are smoked after a hard effort and you're really not excited to run, um, and you have six miles coming up on your next, your next run. And you're like, oh, man, I just, I don't want to, you know, I don't need to, but I have to, then don't, you know, right. like take your body. Don't, don't take your body for granted. Listen to it. Um, you know, and only get out there when you're excited and your body is feeling good. I know for right. my kettle, um, restoration for my recovery last year, I had nothing planned afterwards because I didn't know how my body was going to feel after the first hundred mile race. So I told myself, I was like, you know what? I'm going to wait at least three days after my body doesn't feel achy and painy anymore to go running. Um, and I'm going to make sure that like, I want that next run, like I'm hungry for it. You know, right. um, okay. you can mix up modalities. Say if you're not ready to run yet and you're like, ah, you know, like I really want to go out for a bike ride, you know, go out for a bike ride and, and take it nice and easy and, and let the training and racing come back to you, I think would be my recommendation. Don't, um, you know, don't feel like you have to get back to it. Everything's modifiable. Even if you paid for that next race that's coming up in a week, if you were feeling smoked, get a credit on it or go volunteer um, and honor your body and, and honor everything that you got going on. So um, for for this this um, this author who wrote the question, um, you know, if you're really looking for specifics, contact us. Let us look at your training. Let us talk with you about how you feel and um, let's build a plan that's specific for you for sure. Um, but yeah, I guess what are, what are your thoughts, Loretta? What are your thoughts? Yeah. So I thought I really like everything that you're saying. Great words of wisdom. I also like to take it individually. You know, there's so many factors that we look at, right? So after a race, what's next on their, their race schedule was the race they just completed it. You know, was it that their a race or was that, you know, a B or C race and, um, you know, like, were they using that as a training run to build to their next run? You know, there's just so many variables. It's hard to come up with this, just one straight answer, right? But also, I think um, something that I'm very aware of now, as um, I hate saying this, as an aging athlete, that has changed for me. I think recovery takes a little bit longer than it used to. You know, so so thinking about that piece, too, um, I like to also think about the mental state of athletes, right? Like you mentioned, you know, like, are you ready to get back out there? Um, could we take a couple of days and maybe just um, do some hiking or cycling, you know, different things. And then a few out days out, like, okay, let's try a test run. Let's see how you're feeling, you know, if you're up for it, you know, but I've also had people like this, this was like, let's say their big A race and they really put in a hard train, you know, a few training cycles that they really need to have a few weeks of just mental rest and mental, I get to choose and do what I want each day when I run and I'm going to just listen to my body, you know, so I, I just think it just depends on where you are. So it's a great question, but I don't think we have a, can say like one general answer is going to fit everyone. Yeah. I think some, some mental burnout can come to just, um, from like hero training blocks leading up to a race. Yes. So, you know, if people put a, put in a really hard training block and then they have a, a race and they race hard and they race well, um, maybe, you know, like your body feels pretty good, but in, and mentally you're just like, I just don't really want to run anymore. Maybe you just need a different modality. Maybe you just need to get out there and go biking or go stand up paddleboarding or, um, you know, go hiking or just kind of change it up. So keep active, keep collecting heartbeats because, you know, your heart doesn't know if you're running or walking or cycling or paddleboarding or kayaking or whatever it is, your heart's still going to get strong. Um, and then when your body and your mind are ready to go back to running, then, you know, at least you kept your heart like pumping. Right. And right. And I think if it's mental, you know, we just don't really want to push it so hard that it becomes on fun. We want, I mean, we we're doing it because we love running and we don't want to take the fun away. I have an athlete that just came off a really hard training cycle, um, huge a race and really needed a mental break from, you know, having a plan that she was following. So instead of, you know, really saying what you're doing every day, I just have like, let's just leave it loose for you. And I, you know, shoot for a goal of X number of miles this week however they come, you know, we're just kind of keeping that base there, but not really focusing on any kind of intensity or any really big long volume, because we're going to be starting another huge training cycle for another big A race in the fall. So we wanted to give her some time to kind of 
mentally have that downtime, physically a little bit, you know, rest on her body, but still keep her going. So she's still moving and active. And I think it's getting her more excited to start that next training cycle, where if we had just came right off of that race and moved right in, I don't think mentally she would have been there. Right. So it's, you know, I think it just works per athlete, but that's what's working well for her. So, so that's just one example. Yeah. I know personally too, I train the best when I'm having fun. You know, like if I'm having fun with something and I like my workouts, like I'm going to want to put in the hard days and I have the hard days, you know, like yes. I'm gonna be yep. mentally ready for it. If I, you know, get to the point where I'm like, oh, man, like I, I have to do this. Like, you know, then it's like, I'm not going to like put any heart and soul into it. I'm not going to have any fun. And then you know, recovery is going to take longer or I'm going to be smoked the rest of the day, you know? Right, so absolutely. you gotta, you know, if you, if you put in some hard training, you gotta take some hard recovery for sure. Yep. Yep. So, um, Jeff, thank you for that question. Um, and if any listeners have questions in the future, shoot us an email, send us a message. Um, we love to answer questions at the end. So, um, we're listening to you as well. So, so thank you yep. so much. We've been climbing the ranks in Spotify and Apple Podcasts too. So um, everybody, please uh, rate us a couple stars at least um, or, you know, write us a review um, and yeah, share with your friends. We love doing these. So hopefully you guys take away some good training insights, even if you're not running Galena or don't plan it. I think there's, uh, there's some good things to take away for your next effort too. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, Loretta, for doing um, all the podcasting and all the prep work that goes into it. Um, and yeah, everybody take a look for that other Galena podcast that we do, where we talk more about like the stories behind the race. Okay. That sounds great. Again, thanks for listening everyone. And that's a wrap for coffee with coaches with coach Reese and coach Loretta. Take care.